Okay, everybody. All right, let's get started for a third lecture of the class. Okay, so how's everybody feeling about the last class? Everybody following? That's wonderful news. Put a lot of confidence in me. So, <laughs> what did we learn in last class? Anybody can tell me? I need a volunteer. Somebody? I thought everybody learned it. <laughs> How about... Um, trans versus Gauss? Trans versus Gauss? That's the... Uh, Is that how it's pronounced? Gawk? Gawk? Yes, yes. It's French, yeah. That's part of... That's part of the chain confirmation part, right? So everybody got that? So what else? That's mostly I talked in probably the last uh, maybe middle of the 20 minutes in the class. I didn't start with the Gauss trends. Contour lens. Contour lens. Anything else? Dog product. Dog product. Yeah, that's, that's near the end of the lecture. We talk about cross and uh, dot product. So if you turn to your note, the first thing I start my class is always talk about overview. So we actually talk about chain size. That's where we started at the very beginning, talk about how big the size. Then we moved on to the chain confirmation. After the chain confirmation, we start to talk about um, some of the basic concepts about vectors and scalars. And so how do we operate that, OK? How's everybody's um, homework doing? Did you guys all have the chance to go through the four problems in here? Everybody get a good grasp of that? How about the, our friends at uh, Vicksburg? Got a chance to look at the document? OK. You guys have a chance to look at it? Any question for problem one? Anybody? So what's the problem one basically talks about is some of the concepts about unit vectors and how can we get the angle out of it, right? So that's a refresh about what's a vector concept and how can we use the direction combined with the lens to get the distance. OK? It should be pretty straightforward. So how about the second one? Similar problem. Kind of re-emphasized again the angle and direction, right? should be pretty straightforward. And problem three is even simpler. It's just a, a two of the direction talks about A1 and A2, which is elementary school kind of mathematics. The last of question is maybe we need to visit it again, is what is the dot product in this, in the three-dimensional way? OK? So in this case, all the vectors are expressed actually in three unit axes. i, j, k represents three directions. So a is longer in i direction, which is, uh, has a unit of five, then two in the j, and one in the k direction. And if you use this, this way, the dot product is basically each unit multiplied by each other. And second way, where we're going to talk in the classroom is where the dot product equals to magnitude of A, magnitude of B, and multiplied by cosine theta, which is the angle in between them. 
If you know the unit, you should be able to use that method to solve the problem. It will give you exactly the same answer, OK? So we should have uh, laid a pretty solid background for today's class. So what are we going to do today? Everybody had a chance to read the chapter 6.2? Any questions? Or how, let, let me see. If you think you understand 80% and above of that, can you raise your hand? OK, we have a few. Half of that was written in the textbook. We now have about half. 20% of what is talking about in chapter. But the, I see some of them never raised their hand. You, I have not read it. I was too busy. Anyone? No? OK. So the number doesn't make sense. I got three plus maybe four plus one, which is eight. <laughs> let, let, so I roughly got the sense. Most of you got half of that. So which part everybody thinks has most challenging? So give me some sense before I start. Hinder rotation model. OK. J minus I. Good. I, I, I talked actually last year a lot of mass. And um, this year, I'll try, to, I'll try to capture that as optional. Well, it's very important that you learn the concept first. So I'm going to start teaching the concept. Then we go to the mass. But it would be great you know some of it, OK? So for the another um, half of you guys, the difficulty is mostly in the mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. OK. <coughs> now I know where we should start from. So in this class, what we're going to do is um, try to understand a bit in more than just a, a regular size, right? Let me make sure the other party is connected. Last class, we basically studied about a, how big the size. If you know a, a given dimension, you actually know roughly the sizes. And we talk about two sizes, but neither of them are realistic. Everybody recall? Mm -hmm. The biggest size for 280K is about 2.5 micron to 3 micron. Um, the smallest size, most compact form, is about 5 nanometer. But I kind of tell you, neither of them are realistic. For a realistic polymer, it will be somewhere in between. Now, this class, we will understand a few questions. First is, how do we count size of polymer? OK? What the parameter we need to actually measure it? And the answer will be end-to-end -end distance. OK, we're going to talk this parameter in this class, which typically write REE. So what is this parameter will do for you is will tell you how big your polymer is physically in terms of a measurable size. It can be few nanometer, few microns, or anything bigger than that, OK? So you will be able to get this parameter and get this up. Uh, that requires to design several ideal models to play with it. Because we cannot start from just uh, counting or put a ruler to measure it. It's it has two, ch uh, two challenges, as you can imagine. How would you measure a polymer coil in real life? It's just hard, right? But there's a few techniques can do that. However, not directly measuring, like a ruler. If I can have a ruler, I can measure you know, the distance from here to there. Several difficulty. First, it's very hard to find where the chain end is. If in, even in the nanoscale. 
Second, it changes over time, so you cannot really put the ruler and wait until you read the number out of it. But there's a few techniques we can actually measure what is IE or end-to-end -end distance using scattering technique, which is will be taught in the next spring, and they are related. So to do that, we actually need to consider physical models to describe polymer chain. And that requires us to make quite a lot of assumptions. Specific assumptions, I mean, how do you actually assume a model that is sort of realistic, but also very simple to understand and uh, mathematically easy to treat so you can get the end-to-end -end distance. All right, let's start a journey today. So where should we start? What do you guys want to learn? For the Komodo first, mm -hmm. and then we go to end-to-end -end distance to understand how do we describe end-to-end -end distance, okay? Um, is there some comments in there? Why don't we just start with end-to-end -end distance? Do you think that's more of a statistical model? Um, yeah, that we certainly can do. I think they actually will go in parallel, okay? So, physical model to describe a polymer chain, end-to-end -end distance. That's a goal for this, for this class. So by the end of this class, you should learn what are these two, and you should be confident and say, understand those two problems, okay? So where we're gonna start off is actually some slides, because it's a little bit hard to describe this. <laughs> in a verbal way. So let's take a quick look. Everybody can see it. I know the projects are kind of very tolerable. So you can kind of, if you can't <coughs> understand, let me know. So a very simplistic and ideal way is to understand the chain conformation in terms of concept of random walk. Okay, this has been usually described um, by many physicists as a starting point for you to imagine how the chain looks like in three-dimensionally. And we're gonna start the lecture, if we use the first 15 to 20 minutes to describe what is random work and how can we borrow this very simple concepts to understand different models, okay? Um, you know, Random walks is, 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 as the name as sounds, is basically for you to imagine me as a as professor um, to take some steps, and each step has to be random. So if I have, imagine I'm this person, now I'm walking on the grid system, so each time I can choose four directions to walk. As a normal person, I usually just walk straight. I would never, like, each step change a turn. But imagine now you have a dice in your hand. Every time you throw it, and you have numbers one, two, three, four. One means forward, four means backward, two and three, and left and right. You can imagine when you throw it, it's pretty random. The chances of getting one to four is almost equal as 25%. Right? Then you, you would walk around and going back and forth. So that's a model you can imagine if you pin each carbon atoms in your polyethylene, that would be roughly the model, as simplest as it sounds like it is model for your chain to look like if you do it two-dimensional. Okay? And I don't think two-dimensional is easy, so I will later to do one-dimensional as a starting point. But, you know, random walk is a very commonly used in many aspects of the science. So, used in diffusions for you to understand how these nanoparticles move around, and especially in gambling. Russian Roulette is a great example. This is actually the game. Um, when I was young, I played a 
quite a few times because it's much easier to understand. All you need to bat is black and white. I was naive to think if you have three blacks, the next uh, one, you would have higher chance to get red, but which is not true. Every single row is independent, so there's no correlation, okay, in this particular case. But you can think about this is under the concept of the random walk. So, as I mentioned, two-dimensional give you some idea how the chain would spread in in one D phase, uh, in two D phase. But let's take a look at even simpler case where, which is one D. Now we have 50-50 chance. We think about now my dice is only going to forward or backward direction. So now, anybody get a coin? Somebody can flip it for me so we can do a live demonstration. How does it work? Anyone? We have to have a coin. OK, we have a volunteer. Can you throw it so I know where I should go? So heads you go forward, and tails you go back. Uh, heads goes forward, which is right direction, and tail goes backwards. Okay. So I'm going to take negative one, do it a couple of times. Heads. So I'm going to now go back to zero. Heads. I'm going to now go forward. Now I'm going to plus two, because I got two heads. heads. You're pretty good at throwing heads. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I'm going to have a similar question. But you guys got a concept that if I and the person would take a step move forward, if it's plus and negative, if I go in the other direction, we can actually construct some sort of a computer program help us to understand. Although I only did like about 10 steps, or maybe even less than that, but you can imagine if I and this person following this red line, every time I throw, if I'm positive value, I would go to a positive position. Actually, this one actually pretty nicely captured what I'm just doing, because I got a lot of heads, which is going positive direction, and it will drift. So. Red is one of the extreme cases because the odd of getting positive and negative should be the same. However, in this particular case, I have a little bit of a higher chance to go positive. But if you repeat it again, have another student throw a coin, I might follow this blue curve now, which is some of the heads, some of the tails, then heads again, tails, but they eventually ended up here. Now, we have 10 students. If everyone repeat on me, Let's don't do that because it's going to take 20 minutes. I would end it up a distribution of there, right? <coughs> Everybody following how I got in e each of these lines? We can also in change the step size in terms of sort of imagining it's a change of bond lens, and we can get into different steps. You know, now each step is bigger, so we have the bigger swing of what's the end position in terms of probability. So in the first case, I could have ended up a value of after 100 throws of the coin, I can end up the chance that minus 10, this minus 5 about, this is around 0, then 2, 10, or this is some, something around 15. So there's distribution. However, it might sound like, oh, it's going to be equal chance, but it's not. If you throw it there long enough time and ask a computer in, computers to do this job for you, we can actually end it up with a distribution. So this would be the final position where I am. And as you can see, if we try about 20, 30 times, it's not a, the same chances of you ended up at minus 20 versus 10, minus 10 versus 0, right? If you do it so many times, so many repeats until you wear me out. Then we're going to get a almost perfect Gaussian bell shape. And the other thing we talked about is if we do 50 walks, uh, 100 steps, if we each walk now and take two steps, 
you're still going to have a nice distribution like we have. However, now your chances to reach a higher value is higher. So you have probability to reach now minus 60 if every time you just go in has direction. Okay. So you can imagine this kind of the bond lens in the describing of the our material. So does this sound familiar to everybody where we are going? Distribution. So if now I ask you, if I'm taking 150 uh, walks, 100 steps, what is the chances of where I ended at zero? Now we're talking about probability, right? Because the chances you've ended up where you start off will be the possible routes to reach there divided by total possibility. Correct? The, let me repeat this one more time because it's important. The chances I reach the final phase will be equal to the ways I can reach this particular point divided by total number of moves. And we're going to do a little bit more games along this line. This shows you what the end-to-end -end distance look like for 50 different walks. So this plaza's frequency, so the odds are in reaching this, their value versus the um, the distance value. So you can see where I start from versus where I end from, it has much higher chance to end it up at where uh, you know, closer to the beginning. Because the chances of reach there is much higher because you know I cannot always throw a hat. There's always gonna be a mix of hand and tail and you know eventually they will cancel some of each other out and left me with some value at here. Right? So if you're taking a larger step, what you get is very similar. So how does it matter into our study when we want to talk about end-to-end -end distance? Anyone have any thoughts why we start discussing the odds and possible ways to reach the end destination? Hey, eh, Sonia? Where we can keep going. Yeah. The like average of end to end distance, so we can get a more accurate. Welcome to a Cisco no, meeting. Not average, but um, one that's more realistic to what's actually going on. That, that's that's a very good way to think about the problem. This comes down to an important concept in the physics is. The collective behavior or average behavior for a material versus its instantaneous behavior. So, so listen to these two words again very carefully. Instantaneously versus average behavior, because it will be very different. If I want to describe this behavior, I would never use instantaneous, because none of these will be representative of what happening in this. It should take average and as a probability, what's the chance of you ended up, or what's the average end-to-end -end distance you would reach after 50 steps. That will be have more statistical um, uh, significance and have usefulness how, for how we interpret the data, right? OK. We're going to play a little bit game one more time. So this is uh, talking about how we think about random <coughs> walk in terms of the final state of our material, OK? <coughs> so P in the equation stands for probability. P is the chance of you reach a certain state would be equal to occurrence of one event versus total possible events. Occurrence of one event versus total possibility. So like the chance where we, um, we throw a coin, and the chances of you always got a head versus a, you know almost half-half, that's a one event. And how much chance you would reach that is determined by 
or governed by this equation. It's very commonly used in statistics, okay? So let's say, if I throw the coin three times, if I got three heads, how much odd is that? Which can be governed by that, right? So I heard already a few answers. Can you help me? One by eight. One is how you can get three heads in a three throw. You always need a head, so there's only a chance you reach there. So you need to be throw it, heads, heads, heads. If any of them is tail, then you wouldn't be able to reach that state. So there's one in the top. And all the possible pathway for each throw, we have a chance of head or tail. So it's two. So if you throw times, it's two multiplied by two and multiplied by two again, or commonly used as two power of thirds, which is eight, okay? So you have uh, what 12%, 12 percent, 12.5% of chances to have all heads. And now, it's not the lowest. I had actually has a colleague who I met in Stanford. She had five kids and all girls, including two twins in the middle. That's quite crazy. Then I usually joke with her, you know, you should go buy some lottery because the chances <laughs> of getting five girls is so low, right? Same problem. So now, let's take a look at some other example, maybe a little bit more complicated that relate to our polymer um, physics. The other scenario would be, you know, if you have first step is down, second step is can be either side to side or forward, what is the chance of reaching the D? Or from the start point is top, you have three in the middle and one in the bottom. So that's correspond to if you need to reach D in two steps, it has to be you know, one to the middle and one to the bottom. So you have total possible ways of seven. S uh, you have total move of the seven step and three of step will really help you to get there, right? And we also can consider what is possible location to reach a point B after two steps. And conclusion is very similar when given the example of we have in twins. So you can use the probability to understand how you can actually reach the final step in terms of your chain, OK? Now, let's get back to the reality. Think about now a polymer chain. Let's just expand the knowledge into a three-dimensional space. Going from one dimensional, which we just started, for me to walk and back and forth, you would always have one dimensional. If you have two dimensional, which is now sort of look like a map if every time you throw it. It's also, you can get a trace of one single event, and then you can correlate what to the end-to-end -end distance. Three-dimensional is a little bit more complicated, where you now have not only x, y, but also z direction. And that pretty much represents a polymer chain. Not a coincidentally, but you know, kind of people want to think along this direction for us to understand and use as a starting point to understand how the polymer chain, for example, in the solution state, would behave like, except that Zero is always the origin of your polymer chain. And this would be always the tail, which I assume is there. It's hard to see. But you can see the, how the trajectory goes back and forth. But eventually, like I said, if, I, if we think about the physical model now, it's not fully extended. So the value of contour lens should be much higher than where we got here. Second, it's not fully compact. You can certainly squeeze them into a much smaller scale. So we actually need to consider what is end-to-end -end distance. OK? 
So why also we care about random work? Because I use a Russian role A as an example. The, a truly random process, there will be no correlation between the location and the walker. So every next step is independent of what happens in the last. Same as in the dealer, whatever this row in the next, doesn't matter with the number they showed in the previous, maybe 10 games, OK? So pretty much in the random walk case, the first uh, about um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the goal is for you to get some conceptualized picture of how the polymer chain would behave in three dimensionally. OK? So you can sort of picture if you start from the initial point of the polymer chain, it would always go forward. And every time you meet another carbon or joint link, it will have the chance to decide where it want to go. And this actually very much describes the first model we're going to talk about in this class. And I think everybody already know, right? Because you guys all read this chapter 6.2. What is it? The first one? Free joint the um, chain model. OK? So let's go to here. Call it model 1. OK, how does a free join chain work? Somebody help me. Free join chain. <coughs> Say that again. Can you speak it loud? It pretty much does whatever it wants. Pretty much does it what it wants. That's right. It's remind me of the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> What's the slogan for that? <laughs> Live free or die. <laughs> so that's. That model pretty much should exist only in New Hampshire because there's no restriction in the polymer chain. It can do whatever it like. Even fold it back and sit where existing or previous carbon is sitting, it's still allowed, which is kind of crazy. It may only happen in the quantum state where you, know, you can have two material occupying the same space. But in real life, I could not imagine that would happen. right? And with that, we're going to talk about a second model, which I want to discuss about now. That would uh, solve this problem. You actually wouldn't expect the chain to occupy the same place again, OK? But free join chain is the best model to describe what we are trying to do. So again, I want to use uh, 3D random walk to help you guys to understand what is end-to-end -end distance, and how can we define and describe it? So let's take a look. So this is actually a very simple drawing about seven events in terms of each walk. It has going to one destination three-dimensionally. So is everybody can see it. Uh, how about the, um, um, the folks at the early? Can you see it on your screen? Yes. OK, great. So R0 to R1, it represents the first move of your molecule or atom in three-dimensionally. R0 is origin. R1 is the first end point. And you would move it again and again, and you have R2, R3, and R4, et cetera, all the way to R7. How can we describe each event? I'll give you a hint. We actually talked about uh, something called vector, right? We spend a lot of time talking about vector. So here, this uh, introduction is going to play a role because now we can describe each movement using a concept of vector. So let's give an example. OK, so from R0 to R1. We can actually use a very simple R vector to describe. And we can use the R1 vector. R1 is defined as starting from R0 and enters R1. OK? That's a vector. It not only has a distance, but also has a direction into that. 
then we etc. We can have R2, R3, all the way to R7. So my, now my question to you is, how can I describe the final position of my random work object? Sony? Okay. Lens. I think about that. Is it should be the lens or something else? Some of the vectors. Some. Oh, I hear a lot. Some vector one, two, three, four. Right? It. Because uh, let me iterate again. It's kind of an example we talked about when you have magnitude. It doesn't consider direction, right? If you only add the magnitude together, but eventually the end to end, it does not you know, precisely describe what the end is. But it's pretty much can use this end-to-end -end distance to describe. So you can have a REE. -E. So let me also explain this symbol. So this is called sum. OK? So it means we're going to add everything together and for ri, i can be start from 1 to n. So this definition is perfectly equal to r1 plus r2 plus r3 plus r4. And I'm going to finish it, r6. I'm glad it's only seven bonds. Imagine you have a DP of 10,000, my hands probably will, will not survive writing it. So that's why this is some function is used to describe, um, uh, describe what's going on in this end-to-end -end distance. Lena? Yeah? Those are R's? It looks kind of like gamma. It is R. Okay. You have to tolerate my okay. uh, bad handwriting. Yeah. I'm not famous for pretty writing, <laughs> just <laughs> for your information. OK, everybody understand now how we describe end-to-end uh, -end distance from the R0 all the way to R7, right? So a very simple equation tells you now the new vector from R0 to R7 would be equal to individual vectors added together. OK? Wow, this is getting worse, huh? La Last time was like. Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. Okay, so and for collection of words, first the thing we will learn is if you just uh, take average. So this bracket means average. OK, so what this means is if you now average out, what's the possibility of IEE? Because this, just as again, I want to explain, this is one single event for the possible word. Average IEE would be equal to 0. Why is that? Because as I said, there's a, like New Hampshire. You can go any direction you want. So you can always find a other guy working on the other direction cancel out each other. So the net outcome for IEE, if you take the average, would be 0. Does this sound good to you? Mm -hmm. OK. So what we actually need to do is instead of get a REE, we need an average REE, but we need to get the magnitude REE, which is also defined as absolute. OK? So if we take absolute of REE, we can actually get end-to-end -end distance value instead of just a vector. And we take an average of that, will tell us what would be an average end-to-end -end distance. So end-to-end -end distance, what do you think 
when we talk about distance is actually is a, a, a scalar, not a vector. Okay, so the goal is for us to actually get from the vector to scalar, which is the indicate there, because uh, we know the average end-to-end -end distance vector is zero, but average end-to-end -end distance scalar is not. So that's what I, we are going after, because if we can get that value out, it's, it is, can be used to describe your physical dimension of your polymer. OK? We're going to take a short break, because I think everybody got excited to see a lot of equations. Let's take a break. Let's take a three, four minutes break. You know, then we come back to talk about the second half of the class. So in the first half, we basically did it one thing, introduced to you guys what is the end-to-end -end distance and how can we actually think along that line to count it, right? We now know the average of our E is zero. How about the scalar of that? So we're going to get it addressed in the half of the class. And we kind of already described, if we use a random walk, we can use that as a conceptual ways to understand the first model we're going to talk about, free joint chain. OK, let's take a break. Mm -hmm. Go any 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 direction I want. That's yes. why the average yeah. is zero. Yes. Because if I can say plus 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 divided by infinity, so it, it uh, will equal zero. Correct. So the, no, the the actually what this means is R E E. If you take a one, if you have a camera, can freeze the motion of the polymer chain. You stop it. You take a picture and freeze. Then you can count where is the beginning to the end, which is always not going to be yeah. zero, right? Like we describe in any model, we see it's actually from the beginning to end, and it's a vector. Okay. Now, if you take another picture, it might be point to other direction, and you take it again, it might be point in opposite direction. So if you repeat this billion, billion, billion times, it's always uh, another vector will cancel out each other. So the average of the distance, average of the direction will cancel out each other. So you're always going to be yeah, have like zero. This way, this way, this way, this way. Which Correct. Is, that's why it would be zero. So here the average will not equal zero if we're having a multiple. So we should make No. No. Yeah. That's, that's why we, were, we are going. If you read so the yeah, textbook. So you the average or just this magnitude? It will be average. Yeah. But that's what we are going for yeah, in the in really the coming class. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lena. Can you just explain one more time mm -hmm. how it equals zero? Yeah. So because n, uh, the end-to-end -end distance uh -huh. is not zero, but yeah. in, in terms of what we are trying to understand, RE, in the concept of vector, it's actually just a vector with a certain magnitude. Okay. For a given okay. shot okay. of your chain conformation, okay. it will not be zero. Let's yeah. say. We now have a camera fast enough. We can take a picture of mm -hmm. when the chain is moving around. You can get it, right? Mm -hmm. You can see. And likely, it will not be a vector point to zero. But now, repeat this again, because the chain is going to move around. If you take another picture, it might be pointed this way, this way. So the average means if you take a statistical average, right. 
like billions, billions of times, you would have a chance to find a vector point in to different direction. Okay. So average yeah. direction where the sample is pointing is not a good metrics. Just because that you, 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 your vector, your sample is isotropic, you always can find the end-to-end -end distance pointing in a different direction. Right? How can, how can we care about end-to-end -end distance and not just the distance of the entire thing? Because like there's... That's there's a good question. So we have a way to measure the whole material, but it's a little bit harder to explain. So when we start teaching problems, physics, we usually actually talk about end-to-end -end distance. Because uh -huh. conceptually, it's easy to understand. And yeah. second, mathematically, it's easy to do. But we will go back to the whole molecular and the yeah. parameter we will talk about. I believe it's chapter 6.4. Okay. And that is um, radius of gyration oh to okay. describe the whole polymer as a, as a, a whole. Because your ends can be really close together, but your entire molecule can be. That's that, you're yeah. right. OK, so second half, well, we are going to deal with a little bit hardcore mathematics. Everybody get right? Get ready? <laughs> For heck of a ride? So it's like a roller coaster. We just uh, you know, take it going up, uh, up, up, up. Now we are reaching the point and we're going to go uh, downhill, OK? So buckle up. <coughs> We talked about average of vector is nonsense because if you have the sample is isotropic, it's all going to cancel out each other. So eventually, you would have average vector would be exact to zero, and that means if you sample large enough different configuration in the molecular over time, it will actually be statistically vector average out each other. You can always find another vector. So what makes sense actually to consider the scalar of it? How can we get there? So as we talk about the scalar, you can actually get the average end-to-end -end distance. So if you take a square and take a root square on the top of square, you can get exactly the magnitude of it. So we're just going to first solve our understanding about how does end-to-end -end distance square equals to? That will give us a good handle about what is end-to-end -end distance is. OK? So let's start explain what we're looking at. So R E E square, and we take the average of, of it, will give us the average end-to-end -end distance. But this is end-to-end -end distance square, OK? Because you can see it's it have a square into that. It would be, by definition, equals to Rn. Why Rn? Anyone help me? Why Rn? The number of yeah. That, that basically, Rn is a vector from the origin to the last n and atom of your molecule. OK, so in other words, if we go back one slide, Rn is basically defined as this vector, <coughs> this vector, OK? Not a single one, but a, a final vector. So if you have Rn square, which would be mathematically equals to Rn dot multiply itself. Dot. OK, dot. Three times. Important thing I should say three times. Dot important is <laughs> dot multiply itself. <laughs> Time to waste thing. Oh, here each one of Rn is a sum of individual vector for each bond. So each Rn can be expanded to half of this. So uh, you see, Rn equals to R1 plus R2 all the way plus to Rn. And multiply by itself. So everybody understand how this very complicated mathematical expression would give us to 
that's, I think, the first the challenge we need to address is what is actually this, this thing talking about? It has a sum function, which is sum from 1 to n, and multiply by another sum 1 to n, and take the average. We actually can consider average later, but for the vector part, how does these work out? Can we consider a simple case where we have full carbon bond. So n is up to number 4. How does it turns out to be for that particular value? Anyone? So this? actually will be further expressed as sum of all the dot factors, but it has many components into it. And first, I will explain to you how does these, in terms of physical meaning, in terms of this very long equation, and what the self-term and what is cross-term means, OK? So let's take it an easy step. Let's understand what is i equals to 1, and let's assume n is as simple as number 4, OK? Terms of ri dot multiply by i equals to 1 to 4. What does this mean? So we know this is basically is, is a a sum of R1 all the way add up to R4, correct? So it would be half R1 plus R2, R3, it's this half of the equation. Great. How about this half? Right? That means we're going to have, when you dot multiply by itself, you actually need to consider almost every single component multiplied by itself I with every single component. How does this work out? How many total vectors, not the vectors actually, scalar we're going to get from this equation. Uh, eventually, it will be 1. How about <laughs> let's take an intermediate step? OK, I think some of you might, might know this. So how many turns we would get out of multiply by first R1 to R4 versus second R1 to R4? OK, I hear a sound says 16, sound says 24. Welcome to a meeting. How many of them would it get? Yeah, 16 twice. If someone says 16, we are sold. <laughs> Third time, anybody? No? OK, so what about A plus B multiplied by C plus D? This is very simple, right? We would end it up four parts, AC plus B, AD plus BC plus four turn. And why there's a four? Because there's always going to be two multiplied by two. You get two components. The math says A needs to multiply by every single component of that. So what we're going to end it up is going to be R1 vector multiplied by Right? And it's actually going to be a dot multiply plus R2 multiplied by every single one. Let me just write it out since I already start writing R4 vector. OK? And we're going to repeat it one more time. I wouldn't write this whole box. 
I will take a minute break, let you take a look and understand what we are doing here. Right? It's basically a little bit more complicated version than that, but it will effectively give you this. And e if we expand each one, you have four, 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 four. It will be total of 14. So mathematically, there is a better way you can express this, actually use a matrix. So you actually have a matrix of four component multiplied by another matrix of four component. It should be four by four matrix. Everybody familiar with that? Not everybody familiar with matrix concept? Okay, then we don't talk about matrix because it's some of them might be confused. Now, if you count, there's a total of 16 component in, in, the, in the final one, right? So what are the, f what are the, si what are the 16 individual dot product you would have if you consider this very simplistic equation? I think I need to get slowed down a bit. So everybody follows. Yeah. So right, we get a 16 individual product. It will be anything if we wrote let me copy that. I equals to one, two, four. J equals to 1 to 4, Ri what this means is it's a sum it's a double sum but it basically means add everything together and you need to change the I and J from number from 1 to 4 in number j from 1 to 4. So effectively, I wouldn't, uh, let me get here and the right one more time, and you will see how about 2, 2. One. How about 4, 4? Again, ones. Vector R4 dot ply by R4. If you expand this, it will be only be counted once, right? Then how about one three? Twice? But I want to be clear that one three and three one are different. So we actually will have ones, right? So we will get R1, R three. So now if we write a matrix, this would be 1, 2, 3, 4. This horizontally would be 1, 2, 3, 4. We can actually construct a grid. Four by four. And we can fill it in with all the product we would have. Right? Three, three, four, four. I'm going to be getting lazy, one, four. But I'll give you guys a few minutes to fill on your notebook. The grid is very important because the next step, we're going to discuss why we want to use this grid to help understand what the end to end distance. OK? Take your time. All the grid. We have 16 if we designate this n to be number 4. So there's a total of 4 by 4 matrix. You will get R1, R2, R4. OK? Does, it, does this? So, hmm? Are these all dot products? Yeah, these are all dot products. Because we expanded from the matrix uh, Ri dot by Rj, OK, in this way. It's just a little bit of mathematic turn. I think this double sum is not familiar with everybody. So in other words, the double sum means you count 
sum means when we need to repeat adding everything together from the number at the bottom. So this says we should start a number from 1 all the way to n. So if we look at this is a simpler form, this is a simple sum, right? We said i would be equals 1 to n, and we will add all i together. So this expression tell you we need to add r, i, uh, r1, add to increase the number once, will be r2, and add it r3. Keep adding until you finish at number n. When you have a double sum, which means you're going to first fix i equals to 1, and start j equals 1 while repeating j with an uh, increasing number. So in other words, if I write this, I want everybody familiar with it. So the first, it would have total of number n multiplied by n matrix. OK? So as long, uh, like we did here, is when n equals to 4, we would have total of 4 by 4, 16 element in this simple equation. And this mathematic expression starts with i equals to 1. Okay? When i equals to 1, the first is always r1 dot rj. And j increase from 1 to 4. So the first row you would get is exactly as r1 rj. i equals to 1, j equals to 1. Then you have ri, i equals to 1, j now equals to 2. Keep going, i equals to 1, j equals to 3. And do it one more time, i, rj, and i would be equals to 1, j equals to 4. Okay, when n, n equals to 4, you stop. Then you keep now going back, increase the i number and you start with i21, 22, 23, 24, 31, 32, 33, 34, until you repeat that i hits the upper limit, which is 4. So you will have 41, so that's actually wrong. I just found it. 41, 42, 43, 44, okay? So you would always finish dot product of a, a vector with itself will be a matrix, and it will be number n. So I give an example of four bonds. Now imagine you have 10,000 bonds. If you use a dot product, it will be crazy. You will have ended up with 100, mi 100 million almost turns, right? But you only need one equation, or mathematically, it describes every single component. And furthermore, there is one unique aspect of this matrix. If I have to do one more sorting of this, is where I want to pull out every single self dot product. Listen carefully self dot product. Self dot product means I self dot myself, and there is a total reason why we should care about this special component, which is always the diagonally, right? If you look at that matrix, self product is always R11, R22, R3, R3 dot R3, R4 dot R4, and the reason we want to take them out is now we can call it a self term. Step dot into itself. And how many of them in total in the matrix? Four. And why four? Because we actually artificially say n equals to four. But imagine there's uh, m bonds. You would end it up with n self terms, right? Everybody following? Why we have n self terms? product term, because we pulled off diag diagonally. 
and the, all the rest, we can call it a cross turn. So anything is not in the matrix where 1, 3, 1, 2, we call it a off matrix turn. So these, as simple as we use the same mathematical expression, we can write again i, rj. i would equal from 1 to n. And j, as long as not equals to i, it's fine. So it's written j would start from 1 to n as long as j not equal to i. That's actually eliminated all the turns here. So in the textbook, in Tim Lodge's book, they also talks about self self term versus dotted, uh, uh, the cross term. Okay. And why we should bother doing this? Because for for the first term. Anyone knows what this would be equals to? NL square. Very excellent answer. Why NL square? So that's that's right. So the self door term is equals to the length of each R, which is the bond length L, right? So this and what is the angle for self door term in terms of two vector? It's zero. R i dot R i is always going to be L square. That's a trick, actually. Well, why we mathematically won't treat them this way? Because it will help us understand. Can you repeat that one more time about um, the L squared and how it's equal to? Sure, sure. So the whole reason we want to treat them into two terms is simply we want to understand how does different chain models would come into play. Because we know end-to-end -end distance should be described by square should be described by you know individual vector mod dot multiply itself. And now we separate the matrix into two parts. One is called self turn, the other is called cross turn. And if you look at ri dot ri, i equals 1 to n, OK? Mm -hmm. So these called self dot turn, and we know it will be equals to ri magnitude, ri magnitude multiplied by cosine theta, because that's the definition of the dot operation. And theta is, theta is the angle just between two. So if you have the, if you have, if you have, <laughs> it's a little bit disturbing. But if you have something is multiplied by itself, mm -hmm. it's the same vector. So it's always pointing to the same direction. Theta is zero, cosine zero is equals number one. Okay. So that's why, in this term, if we know the bond length is L, then this would be equals to L multiplied by L again multiplied by one. And don't forget, we have this. And how many of these exist? We have i equals 1 to n. So you would have this means. I would rather slow down and make sure everybody on the same page because that's very important, okay, for this step. Yeah? Um, so uh, the lower equation on the left, are those three L's? Um, this is two L, and this is actually number one. Okay. I mean, because the magnitude of a vector is one, L. What's the bond length is? This is also the bond length. And this is uh, the angle between them, which is 0. Cosine 0 would be equal to 1. So that will give you 
nl square, because we counted the n times. OK? Quite simple, huh? You know, the, the really, the key is when we, when we understand how the dot, dot um, multiply is, when you have matrix dot multiply itself, when we separate into the self term, we get one self term, we get the NL square, where it's saying how you would scale with it itself. And we got a second term, which is called cross term. And we will touch it just in a second. If you guys look back to the textbook, it's also discussed about this term. So what does this mean? Ri dot rj. Um, yeah, it depends on, first it depends on the model, but you can actually use this to start to understand how does it work out. So let's discuss how this term is particular is, because this will make a difference for what different model we use and how this would impact this term called cross term. And I'll give you a, a physical meaning of that. So everybody remember what we talk about. What does dot operation means? Dot operation it means projection. So if you have a free join chain, free join chain, what do you think about average the projection for the next one on the previous one? Right? So you would have one and second one and this would be has possibility to rotate around. So we can call it R I R N. So any given bond in the chain. And the next one, this is a carbon, this is another carbon. For the next bond, if it's free jointed chain, it can basically swing around like hell. It don't have any projection, right? So you can imagine for the free jointed free jointed chain, any cross term would be zero. Because this term, this second bond don't have any influence in the previous. So the dot product for the first one next to the next one will be averaged out. Does that make sense? And projection means the component of this on here. This is positive if there is a random is a free joint chain, you always can find a negative value over there. It's like a great physics problem, and there is a positron, then you have a negative electron. Or the, you have an electron, then you have a positron, which is positive electron. S you have positive matter, they also have dark matter. If you watch strange things, you know, there is <laughs> positive, and there is <coughs> upside and down which is not necessarily exact copy, which is darker and more horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the idea. If you take average, you always kind of, free free joint chain, you always can find a vector which is pointing in other direction to cancel it out, right? So how do we understand from this equation perspective? Let's actually discuss, discuss the here. We call the dot product, would it be equals to the magnitude of i dot uh, multiplied by rj and the angle in between of them, right? And we know each bond has a length of uh, r, which is same as what we talk about l in this case. So end to end distance would have this, we call it self term, and we call it cross term. And if we add this in, which basically says we can take it all, all the r square because this is a constant, or l square, which is bond length square. And the rest is the average of the angle between one bond and next bond. And we talk about free rotation chain, the angle, if you take the average, it will be the cosine theta ij will be 0 because there's no directionality build it into your bond. 
right? So, how does it work out then? This term will be zero. This term we talk about is a self term, and we know how many parts into that, right? So in the textbook, it's written as nl squared, but I kind of use the r to correlate with the other data we talk about. But eventually, what this says is, for free jointed chain or 3D random walk, if there's no correlation, your RE would be equal to, RE squared average would be equal to N R squared, okay? Or in the textbook, they wrote it as NL squared. So this relation is so simple. What N is? What is the value N? Number of bonds. What is R? the bond length. So what this says is average end-to-end -end distance is proportional to n root of, oh, it's missing a slash, n root of 0 0.5 and r power of 1. So it's a linear scale with bond length. It's kind of understandable. If your bond is longer, your end-to-end -end dis distance will be longer, right? And the other thing is it's it's not directly proportional to n. It's to the n power of 0 0.5. This would be one of the key findings we're going to constantly talk about in this class. Average of REE will be equal to n 0 0.5 L. L is bond length. I sh I'm going to change the R to the L, so make it more unified, OK? But what, the, what is the physical meaning? We talk about, think about back, how big end-to-end -end distance, for the example we talk about for polyethylene then. I need someone to help me. With a PE of molecular weight, 280 kilodalton, what would be the REE? How can we get that? So I heard some of the answer. How do we address that? So average end-to-end -end distance will be equal to n. How many bonds are there? 10,000. It should be multiplied by 2, right? 20,000. Right? 20,000 power of 0 0.5 multiplied by 1.2. Four, but let's just use a 1.2 and strong. How much this would be? Probably 140 multiplied by 1.5. So that's around 21 nanometer. And strong nanometer is a factor of 10. Okay. So, 21 nanometer. What is the lens of fully extended? Mm -hmm. Roughly 2.5 micron or 25,000 nanometer. Contour lens. A factor of 100 quite a big difference. Think about there is a 3D random walk model I showed at the beginning of the class. The chain is going back and forth. But if we pull it all straight, you're going to have 21 nanometer increase by a factor of 100 if you fully pull your quantum chain. Um, Coil state and to end distance. If you just uh, take a two-dimensional one, you have uh, 0, 90, 180. If you just uh, use this, have a distribution, 
zero, <laughs> 90, 180. If you, if you add every data point together and take average, it will be 90. But cosine theta should be zero, like what they say. OK? Levi? Yeah, so you did the math, and it says 21 nanometers, and then you wrote underneath that LC, the contour length equals yeah. 25. 100 nanometer? 2,500 nanometers. The, what we did in the first class. Yeah. Yeah. And the the goal is show you actually what would be the chain look like in if it's taking a Gaussian call case. Cuz we talk about two extremes in the first class. And everybody recall what's the two extreme? One is fully extended. Second is fully squeezed, which you can reduce this again. I don't have a good way to put it. I'll just write it on here. Okay, compact. It's going to be a five nanometer sphere. This is what the size you would expect in. And in real phase, in real world, if you dissolve polymer, it's about twenty-one. Yes, twenty-one. Everybody got it. <laughs> so that's the first model. Free joint chain. Is the compact number, did we calculate that last lecture, the five nanometers? Yes, we did. So that is given by if we assume the polymer is fully squeezed, there's no voids in it. So we assume the density of the chain mm -hmm. is the same as bulk density, and then we use uh, the weight to calculate. If you look at the node, it should be in the first one or two. But Everybody gets it? Why we actually has 21? And there's a few f important physical meanings coming to this free joint chain model. You know, it's not ideal. It's, it's not a perfect real to describe our chain. But you will see in the next class, it's, it's very powerful to describe a lot of phenomena. Two key things we, we already found. First, when your molecular weight doubles, the size of coil doesn't double, right? When your molecular weight is quadruple, then your coil size doubles. And this is one of very critical information about polymer, is understanding the scaling effect. If your chains go longer, how does the overall size grow? With? It grows with power of 0.5. And power means its scale is um, here. Because L is a constant. The bond-to-bond -bond lens is fixed. So when you change the polyethylene molecular weight, you wouldn't change L, but you basically just change this M value. You reduce molecular weight by a factor of 10. Your end-to-end -end distance only drops by a root square of 10, which is roughly about 3. Right? A little bit more than three. OK, so Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are so I probably should stop here, because the next model, if we want to be a little bit more realistic, likes the text book describe. We're going to actually use, what is, the, what is the second one? Free rotation model, right? We have to fix data. So we have